Welcome back to MedSynapse Podcast. Today we will invade a new topic uh, with a consultant in cardiology, especially from I uh, Intensive Care School. Uh, welcome, Dr. Hatem. Uh, hello. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for having you today and thank you for being on my side today. Uh, Dr. Hatem, today we will talk in details about critical care echocardiography. But firstly, I need to know more details about your medical background. Uh, so, yeah, I graduated from uh, Alexandria University in Egypt in the year 2003. So I'm basically from Alexandria, uh, my hometown. And then I started my primary uh, training in uh, critical care in Alexandria University. And I finished uh, a master's degree in critical care echo. And that was the beginning of my lifelong relationship with critical care echo. Uh, I finished in 2007. And then I moved pursuing further career and professional opportunities uh, abroad. And I'm currently working in the UK, in London, at uh, Harefield Hospital as a consultant in cardiothoracic intensive care um, and mechanical circulatory support. Uh, my main interest and passion, especially in education and research, is critical care echocardiography. Great, Dr. Hadam, it's a respectful background. So, uh, firstly, uh, I want to ask what is the significance of echocardiography in ICU setting? So, echocardiography is um, a non-invasive tool at the bedside, which can enable us to assess the structures of the heart, the function of the heart, again, non-invasively, um, which, which makes it a very powerful tool that you do the procedure without causing much risk on the patient. And um, although echocardiography was initially um, utilized by cardiologists working in the outpatient settings, but then later on, uh, there was a growing interest for using echocardiography by acute care physicians, uh, critical care, emergency, and now ultrasound is invading a wider array of specialities with a lot of interest uh, and lots of data coming along from different acute care settings. Uh, and the power of ultrasound and echocardiography in critical care is that it enables us to identify the changes in hemodynamics, in, in the blood flow dynamics, which also enable us to uh, guide the therapies and the treatment delivered to the patient according to the information we get from the echocardiography, which makes it a very powerful tool with the potential of saving lives. Perfect, Dr. Hatem. So, from your clinical practice, can you elaborate on different echocardiographic modalities used in ICU and uh, their specific applications? So, yeah, so the most uh, commonly utilized uh, ultrasound tool is the transthoracic echocardiography, which is non invasive ultrasound, mainly assessing the heart, the structures of the, of the heart, the anatomy, the function, the blood flow, the dynamics. Um, um, and also ultrasound can be utilized in the ICU to evaluate different other organs. So now you can perform ultrasound to evaluate most of the organs of the body. You can evaluate the lungs, you can evaluate the, the systemic veins, the liver, the spleen, even the brain. Um, and this multi-organ ultrasound protocol is very important because it provides a more holistic approach for evaluating patients. But this is the non-invasive. There's other ultrasound uh, uh, approaches, which is relatively more invasive, but also very important, which is the transesophageal echo, where you put a probe inside the patient's mouth, which goes through the esophagus, and then you will scan the heart from behind, from the left atrium. And that also has important role in critically ill patients, especially in the perioperative settings and during cardiac arrest, where you can have more uh, precise and higher quality images to evaluate the heart structures and function. Perfect. So, Dr. Haitim, how do you assess a hemodynamic status using echocardiography? So, to assess hemodynamics, um, the, we should have a systematic approach. Uh, we should also have specific questions in mind because performing echocardiography to evaluate hemodynamics is often a point of care assessment. So you will have uh, questions in mind. Uh, number one, assessing cardiac output, how much blood the heart ejects, 
uh, and then you will use echocardiography to estimate the amount of blood ejected from the aortic valve with every contraction of the ventricle, the biggest um, uh, muscle in the heart. And then by estimating the amount of blood ejected, you can evaluate the cardiac output, you can estimate it. And that's an important aspect of hemodynamics. But you can also assess the hemodynamics and the pressures inside the chambers of the heart to evaluate congestion or fluid overload, which can be an, an important parameter in our critically ill patients, because we always like to detect and avoid uh, the patients developing congestion, whether on the right side of the heart or the left side of the heart, because congestion can lead to more serious consequences. And ECHO can enable us to assess that congestion on the right side, the left side, and also perfusion, which is the cardiac output. And that's just the very basic summary of hemodynamic assessment. There are many, many more details into hemodynamic assessment, which can be performed by echocardiography. Perfect. So, Dr. Hatem, what are the unique challenges in evaluating valvular heart diseases in critically ill patients? So, valvular heart diseases is or valvular valves are among the complex structures of the heart, which usually requires higher level of training. So, people who are beginners in ultrasound or only have basic accreditation are not uh, equipped and not skilled enough to assess complex hemodynamics or complex valve abnormalities. So that's the first challenge in my perspective, which is the training, the expertise in evaluating valves, but also sometimes the type of the assessment we are using. Some of the very complex valves uh, abnormalities require transesophageal echo uh, rather than transthoracic echo, which is more invasive. And also in the critical care environment, uh, even if we perform the transthoracic echo, which is the less invasive modality, it's often difficult in critically ill patients because of the poor uh, windows, because of mechanical ventilation, because of obesity, the patient positioning. Um, but overall, uh, assessing valves require a high level of expertise and always using the information gained from echocardiography and ultrasound within the clinical uh, context of the patient um, uh, himself or herself. So, Dr. Hatem, how does echocardiography aid in the management of shock states? Very important uh, question. Uh, I probably alluded to that when you asked about hemodynamics. So, echo is very important in evaluating shock. So, echo will not diagnose shock because shock is a clinical diagnosis, but echo will enable us to identify the cause of shock. And there are four major types of shock, pathophysiologically. Shock can happen because of poor pump function, which is called cardiogenic shock. It can happen because of distributive element or sepsis when the vessels become very dilated with reduction of what we call the systemic vascular resistance. It can happen from hypovolemia or reduction of intravascular blood volume, or it can happen from obstruction to blood flow outside the heart. And these four major types of shock can be readily evaluate, evaluated by echocardiography by detecting the effect of these four pathophysiologies on the heart itself by assessing the right side of the heart, the left side of the heart, but also multi-organ ultrasound can help by evaluating the systemic veins, looking for any clot in the deep veins, which might be a cause of obstructive shock if it caused a massive uh, uh, pulmonary embolism, for example. And overall, I can't imagine a modern clinician managing patient with shock without using echocardiography. It is really important to have echocardiography in the bedside tools uh, uh, in evaluating shock states. And so, Dr. Hatem, what is the role of echocardiography in cardiac arrest and resuscitation? Again, very important. Now it is integrated in the international uh, guidelines for managing patients with cardiac arrest. Uh, echo is important to evaluate the reversible causes of cardiac arrest. Uh, so, some of the very reversible causes need echocardiography, whether it's cardiac tamponade, whether it's pulmonary embolism or acute myocardial infarction or tension pneumothorax. This can all be assessed immediately by echocardiography, but also echocardiography is important to prognosticate cardiac arrest by differentiating between certain situations where it is not clear whether the patient has true 
pulseless electrical activity or pseudo pulseless electrical activity because if the patient has true pulseless electrical activity there will be no mechanical cardiac activity while if we do echocardiography you might find residual cardiac activity and that has important prognostic implications and lately echocardiography was also important uh, to guide the effectiveness of cardiac resuscitation especially transesophageal echo because the probe can be left in situ while CPR is ongoing and that can guide us toward the effectiveness of chest compressions by looking at the obstruction uh, of the LVOT during chest compression which is a prognostic marker and can reduce the chance of return of spontaneous circulation. So these very fine nuances in cardiac arrest can be improved and addressed by using echocardiography during cardiac arrest. Dr. Hatim, I want to ask how can echocardiography aid in the diagnosis and management of pulmonary embolism? So pulmonary embolism requires a, a multifaceted approach, it includes clinical assessment, history, biochemical investigations, and the ASC guidelines recommend echocardiography as a tool which can enable us to increase the ability to diagnose pulmonary embolism. So if you have a patient with uh, symptoms of uh, suspicion of pulmonary embolism and you do echocardiography and you find acute right ventricular strain, which is dilatation of the right ventricle in an acute form, along with rise of D-dimer, this patient is very highly likely to have acute pulmonary embolism. But it's not a substitute for performing the confirmatory test, which is the CT pulmonary angiogram. But certainly echocardiography can help to increase the ability uh, to diagnose and evaluate patients with acute pulmonary embolism. Great. So, Dr. Hatem, how does mechanical ventilation affect cardiac function and how can echocardiography help? Well, um, I think, Diana, you brought the key questions from all the critical care echocardiography world. <laughs> Thank you for doing this. Mechanical ventilation is an important tool for us as intensivists, and it does indeed affect heart function, and that often has negative implications on the heart because positive pressure ventilation is known to reduce right ventricular preload and increase right ventricular afterload. And the summary or the summative effect is reduction of right ventricular stroke volume, which will lead to left ventricular uh, um, reduction of left ventricular preload. That's why in most of the situations when we put patient on mechanical ventilation, they have the usually developed drop of blood pressure because of reduction of right ventricular preload and consequently left ventricular preload. But the effect on the left side of the heart is different and it depends on whether the patient left ventricle is preload dependent or afterload dependent and that is determined by left ventricular function. The left ventricles which are uh, normal in function, they are usually preload dependent and these left ventricles usually get compromised if you put patient on mechanical ventilation. But if you have a poor left ventricle that is usually or often afterload dependent, uh, sometimes mechanical ventilation can improve left ventricular function by reducing the afterload of the LV, improving the LV stroke volume, which can help or can have a sort of an inotropic effect on the left ventricle. But in the majority of cases, mechanical ventilation is detrimental for the heart and we have to be very careful when we manage patients in ICU to make sure the right ventricle is not negatively compromised by using echocardiography, by assessing pulmonary vascular resistance and making sure that we are not recruiting the lungs and increasing the PEEP in a way that harms the right ventricle. And finally, Dr. Hatem, what are the emerging technologies in critical care echocardiography? So the emerging technologies are uh, very exciting. Now we are seeing um, uh, huge technological advances in uh, artificial intelligence, um, deep learning uh, models, um, and also uh, the availability of uh, advanced echocardiographic cardiographic modalities at the point of care. So now we are seeing continuous wave Doppler, pulsed wave Doppler in point of care handheld devices, which is exciting, but also challenging because when you have handheld devices with continuous wave or pulsed wave Doppler, that tells us that we need to pursue more uh, uh, training and provide more training opportunities for a wider range of practitioners to be able to use these tools 
properly at the bedside and safely. And also artificial intelligence, we do have existing platforms with artificial intelligence uh, models, which can help in providing uh, training to the beginners. And we just published uh, um, um, a, a research work which um, provided uh, evidence that artificial intelligence uh, can help the learners who were medical students in our case, uh, who had much higher and better uh, uh, confidence after having the artificial intelligence assisted learning in basic focused echocardiography. Uh, uh, and this is, I think, very exciting. And as much as it's exciting and provides opportunities for education and uh, expedited diagnosis, but it's also challenging because it forces us to pursue more active uh, um, education and pathways for different array of practitioners who are pursuing echocardiography practice at the bedside. And also we need to provide more uh, training and accreditation pathways, which requires collaboration of different um, national and international societies, not only within cardiology, but also within intensive care, emergency anesthesia, and different specialities dealing with acutely ill patients. And finally, at the end of our episode, I need to thank you so much, Dr. Haitem, for sharing your experience and your valuable insight with us and hope to meet you again in different episodes to create a valuable resource for all physicians. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Diana. It was a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Have a good day.